call the meeting to order at 6.05. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of Tuesday, January 24th? So yeah. move. And do I have a second? I'll second. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Hearing none, so move. Board correspondence and communications, anything? No. Um, public comments. Is there any public on tonight? Just Parker. He's recording. Okay. So, okay. Wow, we got right to you pretty quick. <laughs> Uh, so you have my report at hand, but I want to expand a little bit on S56 slash H208 and then S66. Um, and I've been sending you information um, as I've been receiving new information. I also um, have been following this closely and having correspondence on a fairly regular basis um, with Jeff Francis, the executive director of the VSA. Um, and I did speak to Sue yesterday, the executive director of the VSBA, both of them together. Um, and so, and, and we focused our conversation on S66, but I want to start with S56. And so I also sent you a presentation. That presentation had been prepared by um, Rebecca Webb, who is our um, regional Act 166 coordinator. Um, and so Rebecca is contracted by the Winooski Valley Supervisory Unions, of which we're part of, to uh, support pre-K coordinators with the coordination of Act 166. Act 166 is universal pre-K, and her biggest role is to ensure that private providers are meeting their responsibilities in regards to quality education, of, as has been outlined. So that's a big piece of what she does. And then we have Renee Hinton, who also supports some of that work for us here as an SU um, and coordinates work around our pre-K teachers, around professional development, things of that nature, and does interventions. I share that with you to say that's where that slideshow came from. There, I told you that, that I felt like there was a little bit of her interpretation put into that slideshow when I sent it to you. The biggest bullet for me around interpretation, and I think this can be argued, um, is the idea that private pre-Ks would have to close. She's basing that on uh, the fact that four-year-olds would all become part, required mandated by law through S56, of public, pre of public elementary schools. We would be required by law to offer it five days a week, just like we do K through 12 in full days, unless we had a half day, right? So it's the same schedule as we run K through 12. But for four-year-olds, the law also provides us a 1.0 FTE for average daily membership. And right now we get a little less than a half for any pre-K student. Other big change for our families though, is that three-year-olds will not follow under the guidance of the agency of education they would remain with the department of children's who currently oversees and regulates our three and four-year-old programs okay three-year-olds would stay with them four-year-olds would come under the umbrella of the agency of education and still have the same um the regs actually beef up a little more for those of you who are, aren't uh, familiar with pre-K, we like the square footage of classroom um, dictates how many students you can serve. The staff to student ratios are different for pre-K. Um, and so there's some national standards that the agency is gonna be basing their expectations on. So the three-year-olds are gonna be Really, the focus of this law would be that three-year-olds and under are serviced by private providers, and four-year-olds would be serviced via 
public elementary schools. There was a question I've had is, well, does it say that public elementary schools cannot serve three-year-olds? It does not explicitly say that, although it does make it clear that you cannot get funding for three-year-olds other than those three-year-olds who are serviced via an IEP. And it does say that we are required to serve students that are three-year-olds that are served for interventions and supports via an IEP, okay? So I think through drafting, they're going to probably work and clear some of that up um, in regards to S56 and H208. They're taking testimony on it. This law was drafted by um, senators and representatives without really any consultation um, with the educational field. Okay, the same with S66. Okay, these were drafted by reps. And so what I've said, if you have concerns with these bills as drafted, reaching out to our representatives is the, the most important thing you could do. I still stand by that. Okay, that's that's where this was drafted. I do think that that this bill, S56, is going to go through some major drafting, and I I have a wondering, this is just Jamie speaking, I have a wondering whether this bill is going to be discussed and talked about but tabled until next year to actually firm it up um, is, is where I feel like this one might end up being. I don't, I don't see as much momentum on this bill right now or, or having it have as much talk about it as it did a month ago. I feel like based on testimony, I think that there's some feeling that they need to do some work on it. I do think at some point we're going to have a bill. Uh, I just don't know. And this is right now. I, if I, my opinion changes, I will let you all know. But right now, that's my opinion. Okay. Now, if a four-year-old will, will have to opt to the program, will they have to attend or will it be optional? Still optional even for kindergartner students okay. uh, up to, I think it's, you turn six. six. Until you turn six, yeah. it's optional. Yeah. Okay. But we would be, be required to provide it or to contract with another public school within 20 mile radius. So for most of us, other than at Newton currently in first branch, we do operate public pre-Ks and we are serving both three and four year olds. What we serve in regards to how many hours we provide, it does look different. We currently have some districts providing full day programming for three and four year olds without fees. We have some pro schools that are providing a part day pre-K and then they are charging fees in the afternoon for extended care um, for three and four year olds. And then we have a proposal right now in first branch that will go to a vote next week on offering full day three and four year old programming uh, for under public pre-K. Um, and so I just, I mentioned that to say to you that uh, this is something, a lot of our families have become accustomed in most of our districts of us serving three and four year olds. Um, it also has allowed us to provide early interventions and supports for three and four year olds, even if they didn't qualify for services via an IEP. That is one of the things I, I get concerned about with the three-year-old change. Through our MTSS system, we're providing early interventions and supports without a student necessarily being qualified for supports via an IEP. Any other hands up? Amy? Yeah, quick, quick question. You, did I hear you right that we are unsure at this point whether the three-year-olds would, um, if we would still be able to serve them? Correct. Okay. It's a question I have out there. And I think okay. no one really has that direct answer yet. I, I think there is a possibility that we could run childcare programs if we choose, be licensed, and then decide whether we're going to charge a fee or not for a childcare program that's separate from pre-K. You would get no credit for it, though. There'd be no funding that would follow those three years. Well, thank you.
are, are we aren't receiving funding now for pre-k right you do oh we do yeah you get to count each one of those students as it is it 0.46 ray or 0.48 I'm I'd have to look to be sure, but yeah, it's point either point four six or point four eight, I believe. Okay. Well, gotcha. So just under a half a student. But they're changing that if they go to this model, including Correct. the three year olds. So this model would be four year olds would count as a one point zero, and three year olds would not count unless they were serviced via an IEP. Point four six. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. Bill, that wasn't too shabby, huh? I had it. It was right in the, the range. <laughs> Any other questions on that one before I move to S66? Uh, just that uh, it's still so confusing that uh, whatever information you can share that's coherent and relatively uh, digestible uh, please forward it along. We'll appreciate do. it. S66 is uh, the bill that is in response to Carson v. Macon. And so what Carson v. Macon did is a Supreme Court ruling that said as a state, that you cannot provide public funds to independent schools. And then also in turn say you're not going to provide public funds to religiously affiliated independent schools that that was a violation of the Constitution. Okay, so I know some boards have asked me, why couldn't you jet as a state, why is this legislation not saying we will provide public funds to independent schools but not religiously affiliated schools? That is what Carson v. Macon was about. Okay, so what, the, what Montpelier is trying to do in this bill was to be in response to that. Um, and so what they've crafted is a bill that essentially says that public funds will stay with public schools with the caveat of two things. One, are therapeutic independent schools that service students who are not having success in public school and need intensive supports. Okay? That is permitted and they created a caveat for the four historical independent schools that at one point were the designated primary public schools for the towns that they sat in now they drew that line there it is my sense is that that could possibly even be challenged. The likelihood of that being challenged is certainly, I think folks would argue less than if you try to create other um, oversight for independent schools. So that's why they drew the line there currently. There's also, there has, has have been talk of is there an ability for the agency of education to have oversight to ensure that independent schools are serving all students and that equitable education is occurring across all independent schools right that's another way you could approach this i will tell you that i think i'll tell you i believe the reason why it wasn't drafted that way is that the agency of education does not have the capacity or bandwidth mm. to ensure that they can do that mm. and i'm saying that in a public meeting if i was testifying in front of the legislature that would be part of my written statement and comment i do not believe that they have the bandwidth to do and i believe that the legislature knows they don't have the bandwidth to do it so they've created this other piece of legislation that drew the line there. There's some things within this proposed legislation that I believe are kind of sort of add-ons that didn't necessarily address Carson v. Macon. And one of them would be the requirement to designate three schools. And so 
That comes from, there is currently um, state statute that allows boards to designate up to three schools. I think there could be significant movement on that part of the legislation in regards to drafting. And I'm not taking it, I am not giving you any opinion right now, right? I'm just telling you where I think there is movement in regards to the, the drafting of this piece of legislation where I don't believe there, there's, that is, I, I believe that there was a sense to want to cap it at three schools because of the complexities of oversight of districts to try to ensure quality education for the students that attend school choice districts. And so for an example, I know at times the board has requested that we do a better job keeping track of our students that attend secondary schools. An example I can give you though, why that's so challenging for us is we have students currently right now in 44 different secondary schools. <laughs> oh, gosh. So our ability to communicate with 44 different schools and have them communicate back and ensure that we're getting data around how our students are doing, that is a significant challenge for us as an organization. So I can share one reason why they may be looking at trying to have a cap. We are not the only SU organization that has school choice in it, right? There's, there's, and you, you'll start to see some of them discuss Kingdom East up in the Northeast Kingdom has um, significant school choice. They sit just north of uh, St. Johnsbury. So it's Lindenville, Burke, um, in that area. Um, there's a lot of school choice up on the island schools up in the Lake Champlain Islands. Um, there's some school choice up in Franklin East, which is up in the Richford area. Okay, so you're, and then certainly down in, in the Manchester, Vermont area with Burn Burn. Okay, so, and, and you'll see often our, our traditional historical academies tend to be in areas where there are school choice towns, because at one point that for many of those school choice towns, those were designated schools for those towns. So an example would be, and I can give you even RSU, Stratford had a long time designation to Thetford Academy. That's no longer in place, but there was a, at one point a long term designation to TA. So where we're at with S66 is they're still taking testimony. I do, I believe my opinion on this bill is, is that it's, uh, there's a lot to chat, talk about it, right? If you look, it's on Digger, it's in the Valley News, it's on CAX today. The news media is continuing to cover this one. I, I think there's a real urgency to do something to respond to Carson B. Macon and to address that. And they don't have a tool to address it right now. Um, and so I think that out of these two bills, this is one that we need to we need to monitor both of them closely. This is one that I continue to check in on with Jeff Francis on at least a weekly basis. So I want you guys to know that I, I am accessing that resource to keep a close read on where the bill is or where folks may be leaning or if there's momentum on the bill. Um, and what I'm giving you now, what I know about that bill is based on conversations with Sue and Jeff. Um, and so that's the overview of that bill. And again, if folks have strong feelings, I'd encourage you to reach out to your representatives um, and your senators. I mean, some of our senators that sit within our SU um, co-sponsored this bill. Hmm. Yeah, I just want to make, are you finished, Jamie? Yes. Okay, just a couple comments. One is, to me, our primary vision or mission is what's best for our kids. And to the extent that um, S66 truncates or reduces the opportunity for our kids to get the education that they need or deserve, uh, doesn't, sound, doesn't, 
doesn't sound good to me. Um, that's not to say a private or independent school can do any better than what we are doing. Secondly, is the whole question about costs. Are, are, are we being, uh, our funding being bled by all these kids going to private or independent schools? And uh, I was looking at some of the numbers and it, at least from our vantage point here, um, the, the Sharon Academy, which is the, the big choice or a choice here, has a lower tuition rate. Um, and some of the public schools in our area uh, for choice are far more expensive. So I'd be curious on the um, both of these uh, to, to see what the numbers turn out to be. Um, I don't see S66 is providing um, us to uh, fill our classrooms and, and, and take care of our students and save money. Um, the other thing is I'm curious about what educational schools are out there and not education, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, religious affiliated schools and what impact uh, the Supreme Court decision might have on that. I don't think that's really, really big. So I think it's something that we need to ponder and think about as individual board members in our districts and figure out what's best for our kids and for our SU. And I don't have the answer tonight, but I appreciate Jamie being on top of this issue and keeping us informed. Anybody else? And any other questions about my report? Those are two big ones and I wanted to go talk them through and, and answer questions. I think it was hard to, to put that all in writing and have it be something that folks could digest. So. JB, you mentioned um, S. 56 and H208. I'm sorry. Are there's that one thing? Yeah. So it's uh, it's essentially identical. H208 cap carves out a little piece that essentially acknowledges that there's districts like Granville Hancock that don't have a operating elementary school, and that they're and they may not have a public school within 20 miles. And so that that district would be, would be allowed to contract with a private entity to serve their four-year-olds. Which I appreciate okay. that, they, that they caught that. I mean, that is something that really needed to be addressed that S56 didn't address. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Jamie. You're welcome. Good. Yeah, I'm good. You're good for now? For now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I, I would just want to highlight the two things in in my report, um, which just to make sure you had eyes on them. The first is under our goal around a multi-tiered system of supports, uh, and being invited to be one of the pilot uh, SUs for this early MTSS work. Um, and this is uh, you know a credit to our um, pre-K coordinator Renee Hinton, who has been working really hard. With all of our with all of our pre-k teachers around you know what does early mtss look like how do we get all of those supports for our students as you know as early as possible um and so she um uh, got this invitation from the aoe um and so we'll have one of our schools piloting it but actually the professional development will be available to all of our schools so it, it ends up benefiting all of our all of our pre-k so we're excited to be able to have that um those important supports in nice and early uh, for our students so we're excited about that Nice. And then the last thing, which is coming up really quickly, but we just sort of had the information on, so I want to get out the information as much as possible, is we're partnering with the Sharon Academy around an additional community conversation focused on uh, managing anxiety, uh, which we know that um, a great number of st uh, students, uh, it, as well as adults and caregivers and teachers, may be you know, experiencing for any number of reasons. And so they um, have identified this uh, psychotherapist, Lynn Lyons, who comes really um, highly um, regarded, and she'll be coming in to do uh, an evening talk, you know, I think mostly for, for um, parents and caregivers, 
uh, live at Sharon Academy High School, but will also be live streamed to home. So folks, if that's a difficult time for you to get out of your house to go to it, um, it'll be available mm -hmm. to folks live stream too. So this is next Thursday evening. Next week is an incredibly busy week. Uh, and you may be out of your out of your homes for other reasons on Monday and Tuesday. So, um, but I think this is an important topic and we're excited um, that the Sharon Academy reached out to us to, to partner on this, knowing that you know some of our um, families and, and students might benefit from this conversation as well. So. Okay. Um, and that's, yeah, so I can take any other questions or I can um, move into the, the academic data report. Questions, anyone? Okay. Uh, so for those of you, I think I've seen a lot of you at your individual uh, district school board meetings, we've talked about the data, so I don't, we don't have to go through every detail here, but I think it's good for you all as the SU board to see sort of how are we doing collectively as a uh, as an SU. Um, we had this again, this is our winter benchmark data. So these are the assessments that were taken throughout the month of January, um, which now feels quite a while ago. We're almost closer to the next window than the last window, which we'll talk about a little more. But um, in general, really pleased with the progress that um, our students showed between fall and winter, which is about a 13 week um, period of time between assessments. Uh, if you are looking at the um, sort of the multicolored graph on the second page and you're able to see it sort of in full paper, you really can see the difference from fall to winter in each of those grade levels. Um, you know, my eye automatically goes sort of to those red bars and see how much those decrease. So those means, you know, we're getting those students who are most furthest behind. Um, you know, we're getting them, but those students are working themselves, you know, towards proficiency um, and then into proficiency level. So really um, pleased with a lot of the growth there. We still, you know, as we often say, we still have a lot of work to do, um, but seeing that level of growth um, over just 13 weeks is um, is really, I think, encouraging um, and is great support to our, or great a credit to our teachers uh, and the students that are, are doing all that hard work. And again, the, the purpose of this data for the most part is for us to identify where are those gaps and what can we be doing different to serve to serve whole groups of kids, individual kids, small groups of kids. Um, and we've talked in individual districts about, you know, uh, or individual schools about grade levels that are identified that we sort of changed the instructional model, we pushed an interventionist in to co-teach, we did something different and we've seen a lot of growth um, at that, you know, at that classroom and that grade level uh, as well. So I think our math data uh, is really is looking um, really encouraging. Uh, the next graph just shows those scale scores and we look at scale scores in particular because it grow, you know it, it builds on each other that's not you know you're going from kindergarten to grade eight each of those numbers are going up um, and we see you know of course our kindergartners came in and took it for the first time um, and really you know showed that they they have a good a good grasp on those foundational skills in kindergarten. So uh, I think they're setting the bar high in kindergarten, first and second grade that, um, for us to make sure that we continue to meet their needs and, uh, and they make that, that same level of, of growth uh, throughout the years. The, the content does get a little harder when you hit third grade, but um, I, think, I think we're prepared to, to match their, what the, the, they're certainly showing us that they're ready to learn um, and are accessing the learning. So we're excited about that. Uh, and the next couple of pages are just more on the uh, on the informational side. So I don't have to, but if you've got questions on it, what domains we assess in each of the grade levels that aligns to the Common Core State Standards, which just gives you an idea of sort of how how things progress over time from kindergarten through eighth grade. Uh, and then a series of sample questions for you to look at to see what kinds of questions our students are being asked um, when they're doing these assessments. Uh, they're, um, you know, they range, the mostly are, um, they're not all multiple choice, although I noticed here that all the questions uh, that you're looking at are multiple choice. Sometimes they do have to do a calculation and put it, put it in. Um, but they, yeah, that they see those kinds of questions. They can hear all the questions be asked of them. Um, they, there's an audio component to it if that uh, helps their learning. Um, but this is sort of how it progresses from, you know, a kindergarten question all the way to an eighth grade question. So any questions on, on the math? Again, we're continuing to work on the proficiencies and um, I do, I think we've called out before, I just want, I want to credit our, you know, our, our, our families, our parents, our caregivers, our pre-K teachers and our kindergarten and first grade teachers are really, um, are really meeting our students' needs and, and helping to implement this robust hands-on um, 
math uh, learning that we think is going to be really influential in how they do um, moving forward. I had a, a comment if I could make it or a question. Um, this is very heartening and uh, I think we're all um, going to sleep better and we're when we first had your report and I compliment you and your team and the teachers for doing what they're doing and also the presentation. So it's understandable for us that are um, in La La Land. I guess the one question I had was the change between the fall and the, and the winter is dramatic in math, less so in English you're going to get to. How much do you think of that is um, the summer gap. And I guess I would like to think that tracking our progress when we get our spring results, we'll be able to compare our spring results to our fall results or you get a little better sense of that. But how big is it is that summer fall off? And, and again, tell us and remind us what we're doing to try to reduce that fall off. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bill. I appreciate your your comments on it. I think there's a couple of pieces there, right? It, the summer looks different for different kids and different families. Um, so there's not sort of one calculation on that. One thing that is different this year, and we're continuing to figure out whether this is exactly the right calendar, is that we did do the assessment in October. And part of the reason there was to get a little bit of a better sense of how instruction is actually working for our students during yeah. those first you know, four, four to five weeks of school, not just testing them right, you know, they're not just getting that summer where they are right when they come in, but sort of, all right, they've gotten in, they've gotten the routines. So I don't think, I think we have, a, um, I don't think this totally reflects summer slide when you have an October assessment window. It is linked mm -hmm. to getting data too. So that, that is a, a just sort of highlighting why we, we may end up moving it a, a little bit earlier in the, in, the, in the fall. And so we may have a conversation next year about how much of it's summer slide. And also you'll have to remember for the vast majority of our students, um, Track My Progress was new to them this fall. We had two districts pilot it last year, but you know, any of our uh, any of our kind of younger kids, um, you know, any of our first graders across the district um, and a lot of our schools, this was a new, it wasn't very, very different from Star 360, but it was different. And so in some ways, some of our fall performance could just be learning how it works. Um, yeah. And seeing that, I would say that our kindergartners who took it for the first time this January didn't seem to have any trouble. <laughs> but they've also read; they've had exposure to other things in, you know, before January, and so they, you know, they may have been benefited from that just starting later in the year. Um, so I think that's true. I, your, on your question around what are we doing to help diminish and prevent summer slide is a great question. I think we, I think we have work to do there too, and we have some resources set aside in our. Um, our ESSER funding on COVID to think about a little bit more about, you know, are there, are there materials that families could be, um, could have access to that would help in terms of books. Uh, I know we do have our sort of our robust summer programming through One Planet and the Department of um, Special Services to help with students there. But it, I think it's a good question for us to, to pull back and, and make sure that we are thinking um, more about how can we help those students in particular that might are more um, at risk of, of having that slide. Thank you. Uh, so let me, I'll, do, I'll go through uh, English language arts. I, Bill is correct, right? The, the progress here is not as dramatic as it was in math. Uh, I think I will say we, we hoped it would be more. Um, and we know that um, the challenge that we have in literacy right now is, um, is different than the one in math and is that we are really trying to change some practices that we know don't, don't work in giving students the foundational skills they need, need to be really good readers and writers. Um, and that in ch sort of changing established practice is harder than teaching new, like sort of new practice. And I would say this is not universal of all of our teachers, but if I talk in sort of broad strokes, in general, we hear that people don't feel like they know as well how to teach math when they're coming out of, you know, being new teachers, whereas people may think they know how to teach reading. I will say I thought I knew how to teach reading and thought I was doing a great job at home. Uh, and we have learned differently. And so you have to sort of change your practice rather than just learning a new practice. And that is harder to do. Um, and so I think this this is where I sort of think of it more about like a like a ocean liner trying to turn rather than, you know, trying to it's just it's going to I think it's going to take a little longer. Um, and we see some good, you know, good progress in um, when we start to look do, drill down into the data at, um, at sort of more discrete levels. 
uh, but we don't see where we're looking at sort of the, you know, the almost thousand students that do this testing. We don't see that those bigger, bigger shifts from fall to winter as we did in math. Um, I think in, in general, again, I think we are encouraged by where our kindergartners are, are starting. So I think we're starting with something pretty positive there and we'll continue to, yeah. to build on that. Um, and in general, most of our grade levels, if you look at the graph that's on the screen now, they are, they are closing the gap, the gap between where our average score was and where the expectation is, um, has gotten smaller. Uh, it hasn't necessarily, you know, ticked into the positive yet, but has, 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 um, has shrunk since the fall. And so we're, um, heading in the, heading in the right direction in the most part there. Uh, and then at the end there, we've got the questions that just sample questions from the, from the literacy part of the, um, of the assessment that again, give you a sense of what kinds of questions are being asked uh, across the grade levels. Any questions or comments on that content area? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think I've got nothing else. All right. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So uh, you also have a copy of my report, and um, like I've been doing for a few months now, I have a rule change spotlight um, since there have been so many changes um, in the rules and regulations around special education. So this month, I focused on um, functional skills and performance, which is now um, included as one of the basic skill areas. Um, it wasn't before, it was focused more on reading, math, writing, listening skills, comprehension. Um, so now um, they've added functional skills to the list. Um, and really what that, what that is all about is um, really just skills that um, children need for daily living, whether it be you know, personal um, skills for work, um, skills needed at home or at school. It's just kind of like your routine of um, activities for everyday living. Um, and that can include for some students some study skills, um, organization skills. Um, and we're just finding that a lot of skill, a lot of students right now are just kind of lacking some of those those basic skills. So I'm, I'm really glad that they added this um, as an area of focus. Um, the other kind of big, big pieces that have been happening in February, um, we are in um, what the Agency of Education is calling cyclic monitoring. It's monitoring that just happens every three years. They just do like check-ins every three years. Um, so all of our cyclic monitoring documents, um, which there are quite a few, um, was due um, to the Agency of Education by February 15th. So I got those all in. Um, and one of the document areas that kind of stood out that we didn't fully have in place um, was a special education um, procedures and policy. Um, and I know Superintendent Kanarni just brought that um, kind of draft that the Agency of Education had already had drafted up to the policy committee. So we're moving forward um, in kind of that adoption. Um, so then we'll meet that piece of compliance for monitoring. It's something new. Um, it used to only be for like um, your policy on like discipline and, um, and kind of your conduct, um, which we had that one. So I did um, send that one in as part of our monitoring pieces, um, but we were just missing these other ones, which are new. Um, and then also um, as part of our monitoring, um, we've been meeting still monthly with our appointed coach um, and focusing on math, which is maybe another reason why our math scores are going up. We've been having a lot of professional development um, around math. So um, so we're, we're still you know doing that. So that looks really well done. Um, and then the next piece of monitoring that we're in, um, which the beginning of the year in September, it was called selective monitoring, but now um, they've changed the title to targeted monitoring. 
um, and that was for our post-secondary transition plans. Um, so students that are 16 and above, their plans for transitioning out of high school, either going into the workplace or college or independent living. Um, and so um, the, all of that paperwork is due uh, tomorrow. Um, and I have it all done and it's been um, submitted. So we were looking, um, we're looking great. Um, so it's just kind of like sitting back and just kind of waiting for, for their results. But that's been a big, a big piece of February. There's been a lot of information um, due to the AOE. So this month. Um, and then the other kind of big piece um, is Haley Zoride, who's the One Planet director, and I have been meeting to kind of start talking about summer, um, summer intervention, um, ESY, or what they call extended school year services, um, and what that will look like. And so we're starting to plan that and, and kind of get a sense of um, who's who's willing to, to kind of work this summer, um, and um, just so then we can get things up and rolling. Any questions? Build up. Busy, busy. Hi. No. I'm just, am I up? You're up. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. I have a, a, a comment and then a question. The comment is I really appreciate the, the coordination and the emphasis you are making uh, with Anda and Michaela uh, about coordinating and thinking about um, uh, professional development. Uh, mm -hmm. planning for next year. I mean, that's just huge. Mm -hmm. There's no way we're going to succeed unless everybody gets better at what we're doing. And that includes ourselves as board members. And to hear and see and read what you're doing and thinking about and asking the hard questions is, uh, I find, really um, wonderful. My question is, um, could you explain what Section 504 plan that the coordinator will be handling? I know when when my son Jimmy was growing up in the third grade, um, he had a stutter and had to have special help. My gosh, his parents really weren't of that much aware of it. And he also needed help in spelling and he got both of those and, and uh, the sky's the limit now. So uh, would you explain what Section 504 is all about? Yeah, so remember we added in the budget, um, the Section 504 plan coordinator. Yep. And the Section 504 plan is based on um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. So basically, it's accessing um, the school building, accessing education based on their disability. So it's a way to for the school to then document accommodations that and or services um, that need to be made for a student that has a documented diagnosis or a documented disability that may not qualify under the rules for special education. Could you give us an example? Sure. Um, there have been some students that may have um, a slight hearing impairment, right? <laughs> so they have a disability of, you know, a hearing loss, but it's yeah. not to the effect that it's impacting their academic progress enough for special education, but they still need some accommodations um, whether it be, you know, an amplifying speaker in a classroom or where they sit in a classroom or um, the volume needs to be adjusted or their headphones need to be a certain type, right? Um, that would go into a 504 plan. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Tara. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. no. Right, you have my report, which outlines what is happening in the business office for the month of February or March, sorry. So if there's any questions on that, otherwise we can move to the projections. So this is the projection for the SU as of December 31st, so the close of second quarter. 
So you'll see that we have some potential areas of savings. We've got salaries, budget versus contracts of just under 79,000, benefits $2,376, and transportation for special education of $385. And that's because we're currently using IDEAB funds, um, which is our grant to cover those transportation costs. So we're not accessing them at this point in time out of the special education budget. So we have $466,331 as the potential uh, expenditure savings as of December 31st. So on the revenue side, uh, within the central office budget, we had um, $131,000 projected for title revenue. And we actually currently have $155,570, so we're about $25,000 over there. And then um, we received just shy of $244,000 more than anticipated in our census block grant for special education. And you'll see the decrease in the extraordinary reimbursement is because of the fact that we are using the IDEAB fund to cover the transportation costs for our students. We cannot include those costs and what we had budgeted for for the extraordinary reimbursement because then we'd be double dipping. <laughs> so right now that is only anticipating tuition um, that we have paid through December. We have many contracted services that have not invoiced us yet. So as we continue to progress throughout the year, um, that number will change based on uh, what our students are needing for um, above the $60,000 threshold. That is the, the maximum that um, where to pay, and then the state reimburses us um, for over that 60000 So you'll see we have the increase in the IDEAB basic flow-through grant. Um, so that was a lot of carryover that we had and some additional funding there. So that's why we're using those funds to cover our transportation costs right now. We're getting a little bit more than we anticipated in the IDEAB preschool grant. And then um, the triple E grant, we got a little bit more than anticipated there. So overall, as of the end of December, we potentially have a $322,000 surplus for the entire central office and special education budget. Thanks. Thank you, Tara. Nice job. You're welcome. Any questions for Tara? All right, Bill, you're running out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I was wondering, because Tara looks so cool and relaxed, and here she is deep in budgeting season with <laughs> the impossibilities of making all these things happen. And we're staring at $322,000 potential surface. In your experience with us, Tara, would you expect that number to go up or down between now and June? I would say based on last year, I think it could stay consistent. Prior to that, um, I would say it was a moving target. But <laughs> we've got a pretty good handle on our expenditures and within all of our departments. So the, the key there is really, you know, if we get a student that moves in that we didn't anticipate, um, that requires, you know, a lot of extra costs, like that could throw that number off. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty confident as of December based on what we had paid. Wow. Thank you. Anything else, guys? All right. Thank you, Tara. Ray. Hello, everybody. Hi. As I uh, bring up my report here and look back over it, uh, <laughs> I uh, am still waiting to hear from the state about Cognia, and I am still confident that we have a great plan for us here, WRVSU. And the one thing not in my report that I would like to mention is that with the help of uh, some of the folks who were here prior to the meeting, um, we hung up some pictures of students learning around the central office. So those of you attending virtually, the next time you're here, be sure to check those out. Oh, it's the goal of the superintendent to make sure we are reminded of and celebrate the reason we're here. Thank you, and I'll entertain any questions. 
Any questions for Ray? I'll just add to Ray, he's been working hard behind the scenes on population projections. We expect that we're going to be able to roll those out by the end of March to all districts and the SU. Wow, great. So thank you for those efforts, Ray. Sure. No problem. All right, so the policy committee is up. Maggie was doing it. And Maggie, I'll let you roll with this. Thank you. Um, can you put up the policy on engagement, Ray, or should I? Am I allowed to do that? I think he's doing it right now, Maggie. Thank you so much. Uh, we moved today to bring the um, uh, this policy out of committee and to the full board, um, specifically just looking at how um, people, board members engage with each other around board business. So um, there's a couple key lines here, but mostly it is a, a policy about um, uh, orderly and respectful communication uh, and specifically uh, with, with board policy. So, um, you know, there have been occasions, we, we had uh, something that came up recently where someone took umbrage with how a board member was communicating on social media, but in under that, in that circumstance, um, the board member wasn't acting as a board member, it was their, their um, personal Facebook postings. And so um, this, this helps clarify, right, that when we are engaging as board members, we are comporting ourselves professionally and using appropriate language, um, not offensive or objectionable. Uh, and that is separate than our personal lives. Questions that I can answer. Bill, I'm so surprised you have a question. <laughs> yeah, I... My question is, um, are we acting when we're, as a board member um, when we're at board meetings and, and our activity starts when the chairman gavels us to order and it ends when somebody uh, calls for adjournment and we're adjourned? Is that what this policy addresses is from um, the uh, initiation of a board meeting to the end of the board meeting and we should behave ourselves and we should be kind and civil makes all the sense in the world and in fact if we're not there could be a a censure uh option which we don't have right now and it seems to me is it's nice to have that in our pocket even though hopefully we'll never 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 have to exercise that so the reason I'm asking that is, so I step out and I get in my car and I drive home and I stop at Shaw's and I'm uh, picking up something, I won't say what, and somebody comes up to me and says, Bill, you know, I can't stand what you're doing about X, Y, Z. Having to do with the school. And I get into conversation and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And I finally can't stand it anymore and I go nuts. Is that covered that that situation covered by this policy or is it end at the schoolhouse gate or put in other words at the end of our meeting so so two things um the if you look at the one two three third paragraph in the last line it's the board expects that speech and conduct among and between board members members of the administration faculty staff students and the public are civil and respectful. So we do hope that if it's a situation that escalates that, um, you know, you can exit stage left uh, without, <laughs> uh, you know, amplifying the situation, right? Um, that, and then to follow up, we, there is a censure piece here. The very last paragraph um, says that censure requires a majority vote of 
of board members. So that is a possible consequence if you are at the grocery store picking up donuts and you decide to get have words with your um, you know fellow townsperson, then that nope. that is that is a that is an option that we could exercise. No, nope. I just I read that, but I must say the first paragraph and the second paragraph and most of the third paragraph seem to point to the fact that this applies to board meetings and when we're con conversing with ourselves, whoever's in the audience. And I think it needs to be clearer um, if that's what it is. And I support your interpretation or your emphasis on that last sentence. Somehow it needs to be clarified that this goes beyond um, our behavior when we're at board meetings to when we're out with the general public and that we're discussing things and that we, it's just, we should, we, we, we should not blow it and and um because it it affects us all and it hurts us all and so i just think if that's the case here and i totally support that i encourage the the policy committee to make it a little clearer that it includes our behavior um outside of board meetings okay i will i will i will bring that back um I am curious if anyone else has any feedback for me to bring back to the policy committee. Well, um, yeah, well, I mean, I just, um, to kind of piggyback on what Bill was saying, I did read the first sentence in the censure section and it refers to, you know, board members at board meetings um, and in the, con in the conduct of board business and so I guess it, it seems like the censure part, at least, is at least when I read it the first time I read it, it looked like it was referring only to conduct in meetings. I guess, and maybe that's a place where there could be an edit or so, of some kind. It says and in the conduct of board business. So I think one of the things we're trying to figure out, and we'll talk about it more as a committee, is again. When is a board member wearing their board member hat and when are they not wearing their board member hat? And so we try to capture that under board business. So if I was right. at the general store asking, you know, wearing my ask me questions about the school board name tag, then then it would the expectation is like I'm I'm engaging in a respectful way. But if I am um, picking up my own donuts at the store and <laughs> get into it with somebody and being disrespectful that if, if there's a, um, that there is a consequence that we can use um, within within the word suit to say, listen, you gotta, you, you can't spat off like that. But I, I think that's great feedback. So if, if we're, um, I'm not sure that what we will do with that you know i think the idea was that where there's is saying um engagement with the public is specifically around board business like we tried to do that we're not trying to micromanage people's lives and also if someone has opinions on things in the social media for example um we have to make sure that we're not they're not uh being identified as board members if they are trying to express themselves privately. Yeah, we had a question too. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, just thinking about kind of what Bill had mentioned and in, 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 in a situation um, that I noticed that arised um, on Facebook in, uh, Stockbridge um, connections. Uh, so I know in the past um, there there is and was a um, a on uh, what was it? Uh, I, I believe Arsud had had a um, page on Facebook, and we really haven't been using that platform lately. Um, and I, I know that a, a, um, a resident had kind of called that out online and it was almost kind of a jab. 
And so, you know, I think we need to have some sort of, I don't know, standard as far as social media goes. My opinion is, is that, you know, we, we have a really great website now. I think SU wise and, and our SUD, um, the, we've got a great website. So we're just trying to direct people to that website because it has mm -hmm. everything on it. So why post anything on social media where really that's just a place and a forum for people to complain? <laughs> um, you know, I just think it just opens up a can of worms and puts us in a really awkward position um, to start conversation there as a board member. Um, so, you know, I think as as well as say out pu in public too at a store or whatever somebody confronts you and it, it, it's kind of a um a conflicting topic or or whatnot um if and i feel like if we're a board member and you feel that 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 is you know that it's uh creating tension in a conversation i think that's when we just need to to be able to speak up and say, listen, you know, I, I hear you, but I think the appropriate place to have this discussion is at a full board meeting or at yes. the, um, you know, at, at a board meeting, you know, and yep. we, we, we invite you to to be there as public and, and have comments. Um, that would be the place for you to come and, and, and discuss your voice, you know, and voice your opinion. Um, I don't think that's for us individually to, to really get into out in public. Um, I don't know what, what you all think of that, but I know, especially on social media, it's, it, it can be an issue. And it made me realize that as an RSUD member, that's something that I want to, you know, discuss with our board uh, in our next meeting is how we handle the Facebook page. I, I mean, I personally think we need to just step away from that and tell the public uh, and, yes. and that everything's on our website and we invite them to, to visit our website. It has great information. It's a great resource to check up on the staff and the students and all the great things that are going on um but yeah that's just my my opinion and my comment thank you all right so we'll bring that back and we'll talk about it at the next policy committee meeting a little further guys perfect thanks for the feedback folks thank you The other one is a policy that Annette had mentioned um, that's in your packet. It's, it's essentially boilerplate policy from the VSBA that was done in coordination with the Agency of Education. Um, there's one thing that was added based on my consultation with our attorney, and it's in the third paragraph. And it says, along with relevant regulations and applicable laws, it's the second sentence to the end. In the third paragraph, and that is to just make certain that as by policy, we are saying that, you know, there are federal laws as well, right? And there could be times when the federal laws and the state laws or the procedures in that manual that we're talking about that we will reference, that, that they are saying we need to reference could possibly be in conflict with each other. And so that is where we would work with our legal counsel to navigate if there was a conflict. So I did not want to put in policy that we would necessarily always follow this manual out of the state if there happened to be something that could possibly then put us in a situation where we weren't following federal law. So that's why that one sentence was added. My hope is this is something we need to have on the books. My hope is to have this ready for action next month would be my goal, just so folks know. Anybody got any questions or if not, the committee will just let this move along. Okay. Uh, negotiation with council update. Uh, we are still working toward um, meeting with the support staff in negotiations. We had a meeting two weeks ago. 
weeks now? Three. Three weeks ago. Um, we're hoping for another meeting next week. And that's where we're at in that process. Uh, superintendent evaluation, your the evaluation should have come out in email. Hopefully everybody saw them. Please go ahead, get those filled out if you can. Come back in. I'd like to have a perfect score this year with having everybody fill theirs out. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great process for all of us that are involved. Um, and we have board member committee um, mentor mentee handbook. Did you guys get a copy of that in your email? Mm -hmm. Our committee has been working really hard. Michaela has been working really hard for us. We still have some more edits and stuff that we're working on, but we're going to do that later. So. <laughs> I, I started it and put it in my draft. Mm -hmm. It's about for us to do it together. And, yeah, I saw it today when I through it. Yeah. So Jamie and I have homework to do. Um, so we're going to get our letter done. I made a suggestion. Um, uh, one of the things that I, we wanted to see in here was acronyms for um, board members. Um, just because yes. tonight, listening to all the, even me being a board member for a really long time, I'm like, what does that mean? Um, I suggested we put that in hard print because I think um, it would be much easier if you're in a meeting, if you could kind of look, grab your book and look that up and see what that is while the people are talking about it instead of trying to get to a link. Um, but that was just one suggestion I had. We really want other people's feedback. We'd like to roll it out for new members coming on board here in March. Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of test pilot it and see how it goes. I just want to thank Bill for sharing his um, glossary of terms and acronyms with us because I did I did take a lot of your work that you had started. So thank you. Um, that's the link. Um, does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Um, we'd love to to hear feedback from everybody. So please take a look at it. Um, only as good as as what we put into it and i think everybody probably has different things or has different ideas of what they might need or want in there so please give us a heads up so ray's going to share a survey link um that will um allow you to give feedback so then i can share it with the community all right Bill, you got a question? No, I just want to commend Kathy. It's Kathy's, this is her initiative. She's the one that thought about this, came up with this, is pushing this and leading this. Is In other words, that new board members don't have to wait a year to figure out what's going on. And what a loss of resources that is. Everybody that joins us has skills and ideas and passions that we want to tap. And this handbook is a huge step in that direction to, to speed up the learning curve and, uh, and to make us more effective um, board members. And um, as Phil Gore told us, the statistically, the more effective the boards are, the, the, the higher, better performance our students will be achieving. There's a direct, direct relationship. So, Kathy, I just wanted to thank you a lot for this. Thank you, Bill. And I want to thank everybody on the committee. It's a lot of hard work, and especially Michaela. She's put in a ton of hours on this for us, so it's really appreciated. All right. Um, discussion. This whole audit. Yeah, I'll start, and then, Terry, you can jump in. Um, so Tara and I just received the SU audit. We had requested it last week. I, I spoke with our auditors myself directly asking for a draft, the final draft of the audit. We received a draft tonight that's, that's not finalized. Um, and we wouldn't have you take action on it this late anyways. We do have draft audits for all your districts. What Tara has been projecting in regards to surpluses and things of that nature, I'm feeling really confident in her projections. We're not seeing anything alarming there with balance sheets. I want you to know that. Wow. Um, our audit is our is out. Remember for RFP, it's something that we'll talk about next month. Um, and you know, I, I'll say this so Tara doesn't have to. I'm really disappointed. Um, that we don't have this for action for you tonight. And I want you to know that it was certainly a request that was very directed to my, out of my office and, and directly from me last week. Um, I expect that you're gonna have one to act on next month and that you have it in plenty of time to review it beforehand. 
Sarah, did I miss anything? You did not. Um, as far as the district audits, what caused the delay in getting them out to you is the auditing team that works with our lead auditor apparently didn't get the communication that child nutrition was centralized. So all of your individual district audits, they had broken out all of the child nutrition program. So I had to have them reverse all of those transactions and move all of that financial information onto the central office um, SU audit. So that's what's caused them the main delay in the individual district audits. And I so have really our goal is just so the board knows our goal is to have you adopt them by February so that we don't have audits coming in front of new boards. Yeah. That was our goal. All right. Um any questions on the audit? All right. Here are any questions on that? We are going to take action. This is audit. Um, public comment. Is there any public on here that has a comment? Resignations, new hires. All right. So, so Hopefully some new hires next month. Yeah. And that's working hard to solidify yeah. some special educators and things. You need us to have a session? Yeah, I'd like, I'd like the board to enter into an executive session on contracts because we do have a transportation bid. And my request would be that you invite the business manager, Annette Rhodes, and I actually invite, I asked one of our principals to join us. Uh, Principal Andrew Bowen from the White River Unified District. She's the Bethlehem Royalton Elementary Principal in my second. Okay. You want to do the motion, Adam? Oh, uh, yeah, I'd make a motion to go into the executive session to discuss contracts. And we're going to invite Tara, Jamie, Honda, Andra. 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 Yeah, Andra. Andra. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do I have a second? Second. All right, so can I have a motion to come out of executive session? Make a motion to come out of executive session. Second. All right, so moved. All right. Okay, now I make a motion to that we don't accept the bids that we receive for busing and we explore, we direct the superintendent to explore other options. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? All right, hearing none, I'm going to do a roll call vote. Um, Amy? Aye. Will? Aye. Maggie? <laughs> Aye. Sylvia? Aye. Tammy? Aye. Bill? Aye. Patrick? Aye. Sue? Aye. Aye. Rodney's an aye. Kathy's an aye. Did I get everyone? So unanimously, we passed up. All right. And is there anything else? To That's it. All right, guys. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Make so a motion move. to adjourn. Second. All right. Good luck, everybody, at your meetings next week. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Good luck. All right. We're going to get this. Everybody's going to pass.